An excited murmur spread through the audience of mostly girls and young women, and of course their parents, because the concert was about to begin. Flushed, happy faces and shy giggles filled the room, a relatively small venue for the performer they had come there to see. The doors finally opened, and a hush fell over the room. He was here. He was finally here. The performer strode through the crowd, flashing a dazzling smile here and a wink there, throwing back his magnificent shoulder-length blonde hair so that all the ladies in the room could thrill that much more to the mere sight of him. He knew he was magnificent, had known it since he was a child, but as the saying goes, for him, it never got old. He sat down at the piano brought in specially for him and closed his eyes in rapture. This was part of the theater of the evening, but it also helped prepare him, because he knew without a doubt that as soon as he laid his fingers on the keys, the ladies in the room were going to fall in love, if they weren't half in love with him already. By the end of his first song, he saw that at least a few girls had swooned away and were being revived by worried parents flapping concert programs over their hot, flushed faces. Other girls, and even some of their mothers, were aglow with giddiness, clasping their bosoms and fanning themselves, staring at him like he was the North Star in their night sky. He performed theatrically, as he always did, knowing how much each gesture, each grand flourish, helped fuel the flames of his ever-growing fame. And when it was finally over, when the venue burst into ebullient applause, he noticed many of the young women were now crying, Crying, perhaps, because it was over. Crying because they had been in his presence. Or maybe it was a bit of both. With a deep bow, he left the room, casually leaving behind a pair of gloves. Women surged the stage, battling each other to claim the gloves as a trophy, and fought so viciously that the gloves ended up being torn to shreds. When the musician left the building, he distractedly dropped the unwanted end of his cigar on the ground, and a young woman, who hadn't been able to see his concert but who had waited outside the building nonetheless, rushed to pick it up. She clutched the soggy, pungent thing to her breast and went immediately to her jewelers to have a gold and diamond locket made for it so that she could keep it forever. The diamonds on the front formed his initials, and she did, indeed, cherish it for life. Who is this performer? you might ask. Was it one of the Beatles? Or one of the current ex-boy band heartthrobs who've gone solo, like Harry Styles or Robbie Williams? Or maybe one of the Justins, Timberlake or Bieber? Or how about one of the K-pop performers from the Korean boy bands that have an entire army of fanatic followers? You'll have to go back a bit farther than these fellows. The year was 1839, and Hungarian-German composer Franz Liszt was the subject of perhaps the first example of fan hysteria ever recorded. Today, on the Medical Humanities, List Mania, a case of hysteria. In the modern world, we're quite used to the phenomenon of frenzied fans going absolutely crazy over their performers or bands that they love. In the mid-19th century, however, when the only form of music readily available was classical in nature and performed live by pianists, chamber ensembles, or orchestras, the kind of adulation Franz Liszt engendered was unprecedented. Playing before admirers would, quote, raise the mood of the room to the level of mystical ecstasy composer Robert Schumann was among many observers who attempted to describe the tumultuous and euphoric effect Liszt's playing had on his listeners, both male and female. He continued to describe it this way. The demon began to flex his muscles, first played along with the audience as if to feel them out, and then give them a taste of something more substantial, until, with his magic, he had ensnared each and every one could move them this way or that as he chose. It is unlikely that any other artist has the power to lift, 
carry and deposit an audience to such a high degree. We are overwhelmed by an onslaught of sound and sensations. In a matter of seconds, we have been exposed to tenderness, daring, fragrance, and madness. The instrument glows and sparkles under the hands of its master. It has to be heard and seen to be believed. Other writers described the female reaction to this beautiful demon, detailing how women would cry out and shriek during his performances, defying social etiquette and decorum, and behaving half-crazed. Normally, music recitals were austere and decorous, not rowdy and filled with emotional fans. Yet Liszt somehow brought this out in women. Demon indeed. Women tried to cut his hair to keep strands of it for themselves. If a piano wire broke, they tried to grab it so they could make a bracelet out of it. Some women wore glass vials containing the dregs of his coffee grounds as pendants around their necks. Women often fainted during his performances, and men were quite often left speechless. And the story from the opening was true. In fact, the woman in question was a lady-in-waiting at the royal court, and she wore the locket while performing her duties, unaware of, or unconcerned by, the foul stench it emitted. Although the mass hysteria caused by his very presence, and more on that later, is indeed baffling, there does seem to be at least some cause for his celebrity. Liszt was a genuine virtuoso, and can arguably be described as the best pianist that ever lived. Born in 1811, and an only child, he was a child prodigy, like Mozart, and from an early age showed a remarkable talent for sight-reading, playing by ear, and improvisation. His father arranged to have him taught by some of the greatest teachers in Europe, including Czerny and Salieri, he of Amadeus fame. And before the age of eleven, Franz had met Beethoven, who reportedly embraced him and kissed his forehead after one stirring performance. But it was when he began playing in public that the small, often sickly child began to earn the devoted attention of his mostly female audiences. He was brought out on stage on his father's shoulder, kind of like a prototype Tiny Tim from the movie, and sat down at the piano as though he were too delicate to do anything so physically demanding as walk. More like a living doll, in fact, who was, incidentally, often described as being even younger than he was. With his blonde hair and blue eyes, his frail beauty mesmerized the ladies of the crowd, who wanted nothing more than to cuddle and snuggle with him after his performances, feed him bonbons, and fuss over his beauty. As he grew older, his performances became more and more engaging, especially after having witnessed a charity performance by the flamboyant and passionate violinist Paganini. Liszt is known to have said, What a man! What a violin! What an artist! Heavens, what suffering! What misery! What tortures in those four strings! Deciding to do for the piano what Paganini had done for the violin, he began to develop the same kind of stage presence, the same emotion and flamboyancy, as well as the same degree of proficiency. He developed the three-hand fingering technique, an incredibly difficult technique involving the intermixing of hands so that it appears as though three or sometimes even four hands are playing the piece. And perhaps most importantly for his rock star status, he developed what he called recital as a performance, which entailed theatricality and elaborate showmanship. Typically, at the time, recitals began with the musician preceded at his instrument as the curtain rose. But this was not Liszt's style. He let the curtain rise and then strode onto the stage from the wings, flipping his long hair, dazzling the ladies in the crowd. His piano displayed no sheet music, which signaled to the audience that he could play intensely complex and difficult compositions from memory. This was a sign of unpardonable hubris at the time, but it quickly became part of his shtick, if you'll pardon the expression. He made sure the piano was placed sideways and that the top remained open so that the audience could see the violence of the piano string's movements and the dizzying blur of his own finger movements. Closing his eyes, 
whipping his hair around, even throwing off beads of sweat into the crowd. He was the 19th century equivalent of the lead singer of an 80s hairband. He even broke a piano once. A few times, actually. Vienna piano makers had to start building fortified pianos just to accommodate him. And offstage, things were even worse. Women literally flung themselves at him, some weeping uncontrollably on their knees, others fainting, all of them desperate to express love that bordered on hysteria. After the break, hysteria, mass sociogenic illness, and women's sexuality. As with any type of hysteria, it's difficult to understand in a dispassionate way why any given performer or group would engender such rabid fandom. Beatlemania, Elvis mania, even the Tom Jones fans throwing their panties at him on stage all seem quite bizarre from a distance, especially if one isn't a particular fan of these performers. Yet we've all seen the evidence of it black and white footage of rows of young women, their tear-stained faces gazing in agonized adoration at their beloved performers. Some actually faint and need medical attention. As an aside, as a former first responder at several concerts, I myself have treated many cases of concert-induced overexcitement, some of which were so intense that the woman was left shaking like a leaf for an hour and required the same treatment we would have administered for shock. If we look farther back, however, there are other examples of people, both men and women, experiencing overwhelming emotion in the presence of that which they find particularly beautiful, meaningful, or awe-inspiring. Stendhal syndrome, for example, named for the 19th century writer Stendhal, real name Marie-Henri Belle, also called Florence syndrome, describes a condition involving fast heartbeat, confusion, hallucinations, and fainting, brought on solely by exposure to great artworks or other objects or places of beauty. Stendhal described his experience after his 1817 trip to Florence. I was in a sort of ecstasy from the idea of being in Florence, close to the great men whose tombs I had seen, absorbed in the contemplation of sublime beauty. I reached the point where one encounters celestial sensations. Everything spoke so vividly to my soul. Ah, if I could only forget. I had palpitations of the heart, what in Berlin they call nerves. Life was drained from me. I walked with the fear of falling. Although this syndrome is not a recognized condition in the DSM, the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, medical staff at the Santa Maria Nuova Hospital in Florence are accustomed to tourists experiencing dizziness and confusion after viewing the artworks in the Uffizi Gallery or the legendary Statue of David. The condition was named in 1979, when Italian psychiatrist Graziella Magherini observed over 100 similarly afflicted tourists. As recently as 2018, a tourist had a heart attack while swooning over Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. Much of this may seem coincidental. However, in a summary to their 2014 paper in the Revista de Psiquiatria, authors Claudia Innocente et al. concluded that there is no scientific evidence to define the Stendhal syndrome as a specific psychiatric disorder. On the other hand, there is evidence that the same cerebral areas involved in emotional reactions are activated during the exposure to artworks. Similar phenomena has been noted in the city of Jerusalem, where visitors of the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faiths have all experienced a type of religiously inspired psychosis, which resolves after they leave the city. Psychiatrists studying the phenomena have tried to determine whether the afflicted suffered any kind of pre-existing psychotic disorder, but found a significant number of visitors presented with no previous history of mental illness. Perhaps these syndromes are simply a little understood disorder of the amygdalae, the two almond-shaped clusters of nuclei in the temporal lobes that are largely responsible for memory, decision-making, and emotional responses. It's encouraging, 
if that's the right word to use, that both Stendhal and the unfortunate heart attack victim were both men. The heart attack victim recovered, by the way. Otherwise, we might still be speaking of these conditions as being a, quote, woman's disorder. The difficulty in discussing anything to do with women and any kind of over-emotional behavior is that it is so fraught with centuries of misogynistic diagnoses and treatment protocols. Even as far back as 1900 BCE, Egyptian physicians believed that unstable emotional behavior in adult women resulted from a, quote, wandering uterus, which had to be encouraged to return to its rightful position in the body by various baffling methods, such as applying strong-smelling substances to a patient's vulva, or by having her smell or ingest unpleasant herbs. The ancient Greeks added to this diagnosis, and since their word for uterus was hystera, Hippocrates called the malady hysteria, by stating that it was caused by the inability to bear children or the refusal to marry. The Romans were a little more pragmatic. They believed hysteria was caused by some physical abnormality of the womb, such as miscarriages or menopause. All three ancient cultures' belief in the cause of female madness formed the basis of Western medicine's understanding of hysteria, which in itself is an utterly fascinating journey of blatant, unrepentant misogyny. One doctor, Joseph Rollin, 1748, claimed both men and women could develop hysteria, but women were more naturally likely to suffer from it because of their inherent laziness. This kind of thinking did not change materially until 1980, when hysteria was finally removed from the DSM. So if we can dismiss the idea that women went crazy for list because their wandering wombs just wouldn't settle down and behave, and please, let's dismiss this idea, what did cause this kind of behavior? And what causes it today? Is it even the same thing? Mass hysteria, or epidemic hysteria, or mass psychogenic illness, or perhaps most accurately, mass sociogenic illness, is a relatively benign phenomenon in which groups of people in close quarters begin to exhibit similar symptoms based on a common fear or belief in the cause of their symptoms. They can experience dizziness, headaches, muscle spasms, and other aches and pains, but there is no underlying organic cause for these symptoms. Smelling something unpleasant in the air and then witnessing people becoming sick may lead to the entire group becoming ill, for example, from merely connecting the two incidents and believing one caused the other. Sometimes, stress and shared trauma can cause mass hysteria, which usually resolves quickly with no lasting effects. It's easy to forget that the hysterical concert-goers are actually under severe psychosomatic stress of their own making, and therefore might be susceptible to mass hysteria simply because of the hysteria of those around them. There is, of course, another possibility that might explain List and others' profound impact on women in particular. In the 19th century, women's sexuality was tightly controlled by social mores and customs, and was almost certainly never freely displayed among the respectable upper classes who attended piano recitals. Perhaps women really did become hysterical over List, much the same way some women today go completely, uncharacteristically wild at male stripper shows, because it was the one somewhat socially acceptable outlet for their natural but repressed sexuality. A woman could claim that the music was a mystical, enchanting experience that transported her to a realm of frenzied behavior, and that it had nothing whatsoever to do with the pianist's long hair and chiseled features, strong jaw and... Ah, dazzling eyes. One would be marginally acceptable in society. The other would not. And while today's social mores as to acceptable female behavior are certainly not as strict, women today can feel conflicted as to how much of their sexuality to, quote, own, as the saying goes, and how much of it to keep private for fear of social censure. This is still a world of girls being shamed for being assaulted while drunk and for the video her tormentors took of her and distributed. 
It is still a world where a woman discovered to have an OnlyFans account with even the tamest content can lose her job, or even custody of her kids. Is it such a stretch to think that back in List's time, just as now, women had so few safe, acceptable outlets for their sexuality, that when they found one in a demure musical salon attended by dignitaries and society's elite, they took full advantage? We'll never know, but it is worth considering. After all, anything that can make a woman carry around a smelly cigar stump in a diamond locket is certainly worth looking into. That's it for this time. Join me again for another look at the fascinating world of medicine in history, culture, and the arts. <laughs>